outlive the king. Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you and to be in worship with you today. Hello to all of you with us online right now. Maybe you're traveling home today from spring break. Be safe as you travel, and we'll see you next week. Uh, I also just want to push pause real quick because anytime uh, any of our mission partnerships are here, I like to say hello, and, and I'm going to do it again. Otis and Charlotta Garrison with Mission of Hope. Uh, greetings, welcome back to Redeemer. Otis, would you stand? This is Otis Garrison who preached a few weeks ago, actually. And uh, love you guys very much and so thankful to have you at Redeemer this weekend. Today is, how about that kids' choir, by the way? Thank you to pastors Allison and Hillary and all the people who pulled that off. Uh, there's nobody asked for my assistance uh, in preparing for our kids' choir today. That's fine. Um, today's Palm Sunday, which means next Sunday is Easter. Um, we'll try it again. Today's Palm Sunday, which means next week we're celebrating Easter. That sounds like the church. We are beginning a series next weekend called Because of Love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and there's so much more that God wants for us. Because he loves us, he resurrected from the dead, validating his claim to be the Messiah. Because he loved us, he sent the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit. Because he loves us, he empowers us with spiritual gifts to use for his glory and our neighbor's good. Because he loves us, he showers us with grace. Because he loves us, he established a fellowship for us to be a part of called the church. And because he loves us, he invites us to participate with him in mission to reach and redeem all of humanity. And that's what we're gonna focus on for the next six weeks. Does that sound okay with everyone? Okay. Here's my challenge for you. Invite someone to church. Invite someone to come be a part of this fellowship. Do you know anyone in your life right now that could use a sermon about the resurrection? Do you know anyone in your life right now that could hear a sermon about grace because of what they're going through? Do you know anyone who's not a part of the fellowship of the church of Jesus that should sit next to you each and every week in this sanctuary? Dr. Tom Rayner's research for his book, The Unchurched Next Door, reveals that 82% of people who are unchurched are likely to attend a church service if they are invited. 82%. But in his same research, he found that only 2% of Christians invite anyone to church in a calendar year. 82% will say, sure, I'll go, but only 2% of us are extending that invitation. I am not talking about hijacking Christians from other churches. That's not the purpose here. Uh, don't go to your friends who attend other churches and encourage them to leave, right? They got something good going on there. Let them stay there. But can we be different than that 2%? Can we be people who, empowered by the Holy Spirit and prompted by the Holy Spirit, respond to people and families around us that are unchurched and perhaps they don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior and, and be bold and extend an invitation? I want you to come to church with me Come see what Jesus is all about. Come see what Redeemer's all about. Can we be different than that 2%? That's like a real question, and I'm gonna need y'all to talk back to me today. Can we be different than the 2%? Yeah. Okay, good. Luke 9, verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He had this resolve in his heart and in his mind it was time to go to Jerusalem. In Luke 19, we read of his triumphal entry. The Messiah put Holy Week into motion that day. The first Palm Sunday was a climactic turning point in history and a series of dramatic events would unfold. Up to this point, Jesus had maintained some degree of obscurity you remember all the times that he would heal someone and he would say, go and tell no one, right? I saw this as I watched the show The Chosen 
and the many different times he healed someone on that show and they just say, go and tell no one, my time has not yet come. And then there was the feeding of the 5,000 when he healed the guy and said, the guy says, well, what do I do now, Jesus? And Jesus, you know, pretty funny, he goes, well, I would normally say go and tell no one, but hundreds of people just watched, you know. But up to this point, he had maintained some obscurity. He healed and he helped, yet he cautioned people, go and tell no one, but now. Now as he enters Jerusalem, the time has come for some recognition. The time had come to make his mission clear. Go and tell no one would soon be, go and tell every single person across the earth that the kingdom of heaven is near. Let's look at the text. Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. <laughs> um, just pause with me and picture this scene. There's a house maybe the front porch, a nice deck, there's somebody sitting out there on a rocker and, and the person happens to be the owner of the donkey, okay? Put yourself in the owner's shoes, you're just sitting there. And, and Jesus says, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. So those were sent ahead, they found it just as he had told them, and as they were untying the colt, I mean, y'all got to enjoy the Bible more. Picture this scene. They're untying the colt, and as they're untying the colt, its owner asks them one of the most fair questions in all of history. Why are you untying the colt? And the disciples say, relax. The Lord needs it. <laughs> I mean, this is good stuff. It is also the first time that Jesus referred to himself as Lord. The donkey is a big deal. It fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy describing the way in which Jesus would enter the city. A prophecy that was given roughly 500 years beforehand. Rejoice greatly. Notice it doesn't say quietly acknowledge what's happening here. But rejoice greatly. Daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Prophecy, roughly 500 years beforehand. Zechariah 9, 9. A conquering general we know would have arrived on the scene riding on a horse, symbolizing his kingdom's military might. But remember, that wasn't the intention of Jesus here. He was not coming to conquer men, but coming to conquer sin. He was coming to conquer hearts, to restore hearts. Verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I apologize, is anyone else enjoying all of the things that are blooming right now? <laughs> Laying clothes on the road was an ancient way of welcoming royalty onto the scene. <clears throat> this was a noble procession. So there Jesus stood, picture him, at the Mount of Olives with the holy city right at his feet. And finally, he's recognized more than 
the babe of Nazareth and more than a rabbi, more than a miracle worker, more than this royal figure who was entering that day, the royal city coming down this royal road. He came as God. He came as king. He came as the good news and the embodiment of peace and hope and love and joy and life. <clears throat> Lord, give me life in my voice right now. Hold on. Last service was worse. I thought I got better. So turn to the Gospel of John <clears throat> and look with me at this other account of what happened that day. And I want us to look at the people's response to Jesus coming onto the scene. John chapter 12, verses 12 and 13 reads, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, and they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. So in John, we see Hosanna. In Matthew 21, we see Hosanna to the Son of David. And in Mark 11, Hosanna in the highest. The cries of the people that day have become very familiar lyrics that we know from many hymns and lyrics and worship songs that we sing. Hosanna, it's been sung through the ages. But do you ever sing a word in worship or see a word on the screen and it's kind of a churchy word and you don't know what it means but you sing it anyway? Maybe anyone on this side of the room? Yeah, we're just like, we may not have any idea what we're singing, but Hosanna, right? So I did a little word study this week and I found that word rooted in Osana in the Greek, but it's actually a Hebrew word that was translated, a Hebrew word that is only used and found one time in the entire Old Testament, and it's in Psalm 118, 25. Lord, save us, that's the Hosanna. Save us, Lord, grant us success. King David is writing here about Israel's constant dependence on God's protection. He knew that if the divine care of God was absent for one day or the divine protection of God was absent for maybe one hour, that they would be utterly doomed. They were that reliant on the help of God. David's cry was, Lord, please save me. Take me under your protection. Your enemies are my enemies. Save me from them. Let my soul prosper in the peace and in the righteousness that you bring. This is what he's crying. And this is what the crowds cried that day as Jesus entered the scene. They also celebrated Jesus by reciting Psalm 118, 25 and 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Over time, this plea for help as they cried, Maybe you are the Messiah. Can you save us? Prove that you are who you say you are. This cry has changed for you and me. We don't sing, Hosanna, God, come and save us. We sing, Hosanna, you have saved us. We sing, Hosanna, salvation. Hosanna, salvation has come, and salvation is coming again. When we sing, Hosanna, we're confidently expressing the Son of David has come. Hosanna is to sing that I am justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Hosanna is singing I have victory over every single lust that wages war against my soul today. Hosanna is singing I have the divine grace of God conquering my heart today. I have hope today. That's what I sing when I sing Hosanna. When you sing Hosanna, you're singing, I am a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Is anybody awake today? When I sing Hosanna, I'm singing, I'm adopted into the family of God. For all who call upon the name of the Lord have the right to become a son 
have the right to become a daughter. I sing Hosanna, I'm singing I'm a royal priesthood and I'm a co-heir with Christ. And when I sing Hosanna, I'm singing I have eternal life and there's not a single thing or a single person, scripture says, that can snatch me out of God's hand. Is this good news for anybody? When I sing Hosanna, I'm singing that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Does anybody have anything that you're afraid of today? Oh, you better be honest, you're in church. Does anybody have anything you're afraid of today? Anybody have anything you're worried about tomorrow? Anybody over here worried about something tomorrow? Sing Hosanna, just sing Hosanna. Oh my goodness, no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation. You know what nothing means? No thing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hosanna. Amen? Ooh. What followed the triumphal entry of Jesus is how I would like to wrap up this message today. To briefly visit each moment that Jesus shared and traveled that week. I mentioned earlier that a series of dramatic events would unfold. So let's look at those. And as you listen, know that every single one of these events unfolded because of just how much Jesus loves you. I want you to know today Jesus loves you. You question that at times? Please don't. Jesus loves you. Have you done something that you're ashamed of? And you feel unlovable? How could Jesus, I'm speaking to you right now, Jesus loves you. He loves you. And everything that we visit in Holy Week here, it shows just how far he went to atone for our sin. It shows how much he loved you in that very moment. Because I assure you that you were on the forefront of his mind. Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem. As we've looked in the text today, crowds joyfully waved their palm branches in the air and they shouted Hosanna in the highest. Is this the one that can save us? On Monday, Jesus clears the temple. The temple courts were full of money changers and as he turns over their tables, he says, my house will be a house of prayer. On Tuesday, Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. At the temple, religious leaders were angry at him for establishing himself as a spiritual authority. They attempted to ambush him and arrest him. But Jesus avoided their traps. There was tension in the air between Jesus and these religious leaders. At the Mount of Olives, Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse, which was a prophecy about the end of the age, about his second coming, and about final judgment. Also, Judas negotiated with the Sanhedrin, the court of ancient Israel. It would soon be time to betray Jesus. The Bible doesn't say what Jesus did on Wednesday, but because he was staying in Bethany, 
Perhaps he was spending time with his beloved friends, Lazarus, Mary, Martha. On Thursday, Holy Week takes a somber turn. That evening in the upper room, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He washed the feet of the one who would soon betray him. And they shared together in the Passover feast. That night he established and gave instructions on the Lord's Supper. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed in agony. He was betrayed and arrested and the council started to make their case against him. On Friday, Christ was sentenced to death by crucifixion. One of the most horrific and disgraceful methods of capital punishment. He was spit on and mocked, beaten, and a crown of thorns was pressed into his skull. He carried his own cross to Calvary. Nails pierced his wrists and his feet. And he spoke, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. To the criminal next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. To his mother and disciple, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And around the ninth hour, he breathed his last breath. And he died. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless, Lamb of God, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. That's Holy Week. That's where we linger. But the story doesn't stop there. In the words of author Bob Goff, darkness fell, his friends scattered, and hope seemed lost. But heaven just started counting. One, two, three. And that's what we celebrate next week. Stand to your feet and let's sing Hosanna this morning.